We will be developing for our future generations, and we will ensure that the needs of Singaporeans are met, and that is central to all developments. It doesn't exist for its own sake. But as we develop, as we ramp up our infrastructure, it is clear that I think Singaporeans are naturally concerned that some of these developments will have an impact on our natural environment, and over and above that, also our collective social, cultural heritage. And with it, our personal memories and identity, sense of identity, which I think many Singaporeans have expressed. Certainly in our Singapore conversation, many Singaporeans have talked about it, and our heritage, our environment, arts, culture, are all important aspects that we need to pay attention to even as we develop. And I understand and fully share these concerns, which is why it is important for us to be careful and deliberate in the process. And at the end of it is, what is the correct balance and what's the approach that we need to take? And, and that is the question, isn't it? What really is the correct balance? And that's where the difficulties start. Because many of us actually do have different perspectives. The balance between conservation and development is highly subjective and very much contextual as well. So, for example, one may strongly believe that this patch of greenery is very important or this old school is really precious and we should maintain it. But somebody else would be like, you know, it doesn't really matter. Why are we spending so much time, so much resources, you know, dragging our feet on, on the issue? And, and these are issues which I think we have to contend with. It's not about who is right or wrong, but at the end of it, there are many different views in society. But I think what we need to strive to achieve really is a win-win situation. We may not be able to achieve that win-win scenario in specific cases, but as a system, as a society, I think that's something that we can endeavour to achieve and it's something that we can work towards. So as a government, what we really need to do is to be able to balance these views, to seek out the views, to engage stakeholders. Singaporeans who care about uh, the environment, who care about history and heritage, take on the feedback and then to ascertain what exactly we need to do. Our focus, and I think it's important to emphasize this, is to ensure that every Singaporean, both for today and for tomorrow, will have good homes, they will have good jobs, and they have a good quality of life. Our definitions of each of them might vary in some ways, but at the end of it, it has to be about Singaporeans. Our heritage and environment clearly forms an important part of this equation. It's not a mathematical equation. It's very hard to quantify that way but it is part of this equation. But I think it's important to also understand that they also don't exist for their own sake. And this is where we have talked about this before, but it's useful to remind ourselves that within this 714 square kilometres of land that we call home, that we call Singapore, we have to decide where we're going to live, where we're going to work, where we're going to play, which patches of greenery we should preserve, which buildings, which area of heritage, of heritage significance we should maintain and preserve. And there's also defence and security needs. And obviously something that we're all familiar with is how, and the need to be self-sufficient in water. And you need to cater space for that as well. All these different factors are important because they impact on our lives. There are Singaporean interests. But within this space, how do we make those choices? And that, therein lies the challenges that Singapore faces. And I think we have managed it in our own ways, defy the odds in many ways, and find our balance. And this balance will continue to evolve. So in all planning, we must put our people and our needs first. We have approached nature and heritage conservation in the following three ways. First, let's identify the land and set aside these areas through land zoning for nature and heritage. That's important. Secondly, let's assess proposed developments, as highlighted earlier, and I'll talk a bit more about this later, how these developments may affect our environment and consider options, measures to mitigate, adjust, change. Thirdly, we make the most of what we have, whether developed, whether conserved, whether preserved, to make Singapore the best home for all Singaporeans for all time. And these principles are fundamental. But how judgments and trade-offs are made really will be determined by the priority of the needs of our people, of our families, and these will evolve with time. So as a government, we will have to make decisions that reflect the collective interests of Singaporeans. 
there will always be interest groups, and it's important to have interest groups. And actually, it is a very good development to see that interest groups grow. But sometimes, interest groups are also very focused on particular areas, particular areas of concern. Not that it's not valid, but I think it's important to also weigh that against the collective needs and the collective interests of all our people. But the positive story really is that I think we are beginning to work closely with the increasing number of interest groups and to really tap on their expertise and knowledge. And that's something that we should continue to do. So let me first talk about being green for our people. So with your permission, Madam Speaker, I've asked the clerk to play some uh, pictures on the LED screens. I'm not sure whether we... The pictures haven't quite appeared. Okay. I'm not sure whether we are aware of the significance, but this year we commemorate 50 years of our CT's greening efforts. 50 years from the first tree planting exercise, the first tree planting by Mr. Lee Kuan Yew back in 1963. Despite our focus, as you can well imagine at that stage, really is about survival, economic, physical security and so on. Our founding fathers had the foresight that Singapore needed to be green, even before it was a fashionable thing to, to, to do so. In fact, I could imagine Singaporeans wondering why are we wasting time, you know, perhaps putting in effort in these areas rather than in other areas which were pressing, housing our people, providing and meeting their basic needs. But yet, it was something we paid attention to. We paid attention to the emissions, the standard of cleanliness for industries and so on. 1.4 million trees have since been planted to enhance our streets and gardens. And this will continue. We are committed, we are committed to retaining about a, ten a tenth of our land for nature reserves and parks. And I'll repeat that. We are committed to retaining about a tenth of our land for nature reserves and parks. Now, this is actually very significant for a highly urbanized city state like Singapore. And this is our commitment in terms of land planning. And many other countries have also, experts have also observed, and parks is placed not in any other ministry, it's placed in the Ministry of National Development, because we see that as integral to the development of our country as well. We have protected four nature reserves, representing the key native ecosystems that are found in Singapore, where the biodiversity are amongst the richest in the region. We have also planned for green recreational areas where Singaporeans live at least 85% of our homes were within 400 meters walking distance to a park. Just as we talk about in the LTA plan, by 2030, 80% of our homes will be within a certain walking distance to MRT stations. That is our commitment, and that's what we plan to do, to provide that green space for our people. This year, Singaporeans can look forward to the completion of new parks, like Holland Village Park, Woodlands Town Park East, and Choa Chu Kang Park Extension. Adding to, I'm not sure whether we are aware of the numbers, 350 parks that we have today in Singapore. Some of our older parks, like Sambawang and Changi Beach Park, have been given fresh new looks. These parks will be complemented by more park connectors that will continue to grow across the island. Vertical greenery, rooftop gardens, and the transformation of our waterways into recreational areas. And indeed, this represents an awareness of the impact that greenery has on the environment, as Mr. Yi Jianzhong shared earlier, which is why the commitment to make sure that Singapore remains green remains a central focus of our development plan as well. Now, there will be those who argue that you know, parks and waterways are not natural, and they are absolutely right. In the first place, a city to begin with really is an artificial construct. And in a city, nature and biodiversity can be managed to prosper. And we are putting in resources to do so. So things that we can preserve, the natural tracks that we have, we preserve it. But in other areas, how do we cultivate, how do we adapt, how do we adjust to promote that growth? And it is growing and thriving. So fortunately for us especially, we do also have a very active community of volunteers who actually also understand this. So they not only advocate the conservation of nature, they roll up their sleeves, they work together with our authorities, whether with NPARCs, with MUA, PUB, to work on maintaining the greenery and, and enrich the biodiversity that we find in Singapore. And this has allowed us to do more and to do better. This year, for example, the Ecolink at BKE is a 50 meter wide natural platform that will stretch across the BKE when, and when completed, it will reconnect after many years of separation the central catchment reserve 
to the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. And this is significant. The Kiam Hock Nature Way, which was developed with the community and was recently launched. Now, these efforts are important because they encourage the movement of birds, butterflies, like wildlife, which, and there is wildlife in Singapore, between our nature reserves and parks. By 2015, we aim to create 60 kilometres of such nature ways, including at Tampanese, Yishun Mandai, and the Admiralty area. Our park connectors and recreational waterways will also play a very significant and complementary role as they crisscross this island and intersect with these nature reserves as well. Now, our green efforts have been noticed by experts. Peter Newman, who is a professor of sustainability at Curtin University, said that he was looking forward and looking for an innovative edge in biophilic cities. And he thinks he has found it in Singapore. Now, what are biophilic cities? Well, they are cities that contain an abundance in nature in close proximity to large numbers of urban dwellers, where its people feel a deep affinity with the unique flora and fauna found in these cities. So do take a look at his videos, which is posted up on YouTube. And I would encourage you to take a look, and you'll be amazed. It reminds us about how much we have actually done in the last 50 years, and we do intend to continue to work along these lines. While well, many cities have lost their biodiversity and greenery to urbanization, and remember, many of these cities have a hinterland to talk about. We don't, but yet we're able to maintain this, and we will build up this effort, not to just to be a garden city, but to really be a city in the garden. Now, can we be greener? We can be. But there will be, inevitably, the trade-offs that I talked about earlier. We need to be green. We need to look at the heritage, environment. We need to create a space for water sustainability to live, work, and play. And we fully appreciate the emotive value of these places. But we also have the wider needs of our population to contend with. So how do we strike that balance? But our commitment is to make sure that greenery remains part and parcel of our landscape. Ms. Faisal Jamal and Mr. Yijian Jong asked about the government's process to assess the environmental impact of development projects. Currently, agencies within the government collectively evaluate the possible impacts of all development proposals, including traffic, drainage, biodiversity, and air and water quality. In particular, agencies will require major development projects to undergo an environmental impact assessment, especially when they are near to sensitive areas such as nature reserves, uh, nature areas and maritime and coastal areas. So based on these studies, the government will examine whether the project can proceed and if potential impacts can be mitigated by modifying the scale or scope of the development works. So these EIAs will be gazetted and will be available for public viewing. And we will involve the various stakeholders to tap on their expertise and their concerns. MND's recent land use plan has indicated areas where reclamation might take place in the future. Now, these areas are part of our longer-term plans to provide additional physical capacity in our country. In fact, a lot of Singapore is reclaimed. But firm decisions on reclamation are taken after the EIAs are conducted. So the EIA will be conducted, and we will evaluate the situation. Now, there's a question of can we, should we develop, have EIAs for every single development? The truth of the matter is, I think in every patch of green that you find, for those of us who are amateur botanists or who are interested in macro photography, you will realize that there is life in every patch of green. But does it mean that you need to do an EIA for all these things before developments can take place? We don't believe so. The planning process is in place for development proposals to be assessed. So NPARCs routinely, and they carry out surveys of all the different areas of greenery in Singapore. And in their assessment, the biodiversity of many of these green areas, not to say that there's no life there, but the biodiversity of green areas zoned for housing and other developments generally do not come near to the richness of our nature reserves and nature areas, which we have set aside. So EIAs do take up time. They take up resources. As such, we should apply them selectively to projects that may most adversely impact our protected natural spaces, as well as coastal and maritime environments. Maybe just as a quick point, uh, Mr. Yijian Zhong mentioned about the report on flood mitigations and so on. I would highlight that um, in the report itself, the expert panel did not say that large-scale rapid urbanization is a key contributor to the recent increase of flooding in Singapore. Urbanization has led to an increase in stormwater runoff, and this is what the report says in the executive summary. 
and that we need to introduce measures to mitigate the effects of such urbanization. However, the effects are often complex and require further modeling and analysis supported by high resolution data. The additional analysis should also include an assessment of whether the runoff coefficients traditionally used in Singapore are appropriate given the high intensity of rainfall compared with the areas where the runoff coefficients were derived. In the final report, it elaborates a bit further. So but what is important is we do pay attention to these things and some of the concerns about ambient temperature and so on, which is why the commitment to make sure that Singapore remains green. Now let me talk about our built heritage. Like our greening efforts, you know, we put in effort to conserve what built heritage that we have, and we will continue to develop this and emphasize on it. Since the 1980s, URA has conserved over 7,000 buildings, 7,000 buildings in more than 100 areas, including historic districts like Chinatown, Kampong Glam that we talked about earlier, Little India. And we will continue to conserve more significant older buildings when there's an opportunity to do so. But at the same time, as mentioned, you also have to weigh that against the other needs that will arise with time. Actually, our built heritage is valuable not just purely because of the art architectural and the significance of the buildings. It is also the memories that we attach to the activities that used to take place. And many of us have personal memories of these spaces as well. So on the hardware side, conserving isn't the difficult part. It's actually the software side. What do we do with these buildings? What do we do with these spaces? How do we try to maintain, I think it's highlighted by some of the members, the memories and activities, and how do you preserve that sense of the place? Now, these issues are important, and they're actually also very subjective in many ways. But that's why I think public participation in this course is actually particularly important to help us in the government and the authorities to evolve our approach in managing them. So where possible, we will maintain the original use of the old buildings, but where we are not able to do so, planners in URA try to find workable win-win solutions to provide flexibility to owners, whether in usage or intensification, as long as they retain the key exterior elements of the building. For example, our two historic buildings, the City Hall and the former Supreme Court, will be converted into state-of-the-art National Art Gallery. This is in Prime District, but we decided that it's best to preserve it in this way, and not only that, to promote the arts and culture at the same time. And we all look forward to its opening in 2015. And the concept of adaptive reuse can apply to heritage areas as well. Many historical sites, areas have been conserved in terms of their buildings, but I think it's important to also look at the use, as highlighted by Ms. Faisal Jamal earlier. But what are the policies in place? I think URA will play its active role to manage the use. Uh, we do zone these heritage areas for commercial and mixed use, shops, residences, institutions, restaurants, and so on. Activities that are not so compatible with these areas, such as nightclubs, drinking joints, massage parlors, and the like, will be discouraged in some of these spaces. And we will pay attention to that. But importantly, I think this is where the community and the ground-up effort needs to take place. And we believe that it is best that the community discuss and she collectively shape the character of these areas. So ground-up areas, ideas are most welcome and we will support this process because we believe that the local community and those who are passionate about the concerns are best placed to determine what might work best rather than have the government impose its view from the top. And we will facilitate that conversation and evolve that common space. So in this context, I'm pleased to note that stakeholders at Kampung Glam and Chinatown have taken the initiative to refresh and enliven these historical areas. So what we hope to see, actually, in terms of pilot projects as Haji Lane, Ansiang Hill, Club Street, will be also car-free on weekend evenings to allow pedestrians to freely stroll along the street and enjoy the various activities and programs in those areas. And we hope that it will spill over, and we hope that this pilot will be successful and we can continue in different forms, perhaps elsewhere as well. And we will support these ground-up initiatives. <coughs> So in fact, I think as pointed out by Mr. Peng Huat, I think our focus on heritage and history has to go beyond just historical districts and it has to go into the heartlands, where we live. And our heritage and identity really starts with the place that we grew up with, the place that we are living, even though we develop. And this is where we need to strengthen it through group planning, design, and actively collaborate with residents. In recent years, HDB has launched our remaking our heartland programs to rejuvenate our housing estates without losing the historical character and social memories. Dawson Estate, for example, in Queenstown, HDB launched a call for heritage items exercise in 2008 to encourage residents to share stories and donate personal items. I, I don't know whether you remember Ta Chong Emporium 
in the area. I remember it well. I used to go there when I was young. Apparently, there was a Tatsong Emporium discount card, which you can see there. I don't think I got this discount card. Storyboards have been put up along Alexandra Canal, a linear park, to recount the transformation of this estate. Now, it's not the same, obviously, as preserving the entire old estate, but I think it goes a long way to capture a slice of history which many of us uh, relate to and provide that as a continuity with our past. In Yishun, Heritage Garden was installed to recall the history of Yishun, and heritage panels were also installed along my waterway at Pongo. Similar initiatives to commemorate Heartland Heritage will be rolled out in the next phase of the program at Aukang, at East Coast and Jurong Lake. And this is where I'll make a personal plea to all our members in this house. Can you imagine if all of us were to do this in our respective estates? My RC chairman in Pingyi Gardens, actively, and because we've discussed about it, found an old resident who lived in the area and she took up old pictures and had been interviewing her about her stories of what it was like in Pingyi in school previously and in what was in the area. Can you imagine what it would be like if all of us begin to create our own little histories in the places we live? Mobilizing our residents and engaging history buffs, experts to guide us in the process. And that's about building history at the local level. And I think there's a tremendous potential to actually help us relate to the place that we live. And that's part of nation building as well. And HDB will also be planning, in the planning of new towns, actually incorporate the area's heritage. So for example, in Pongo, we will retain Old Pongo Road as a pedestrian trail to connect Pongo's town park to the seafront at Pongo Point. For Bidadari, the HDB is studying the feasibility of retaining some of the beautiful mature trees in the area and incorporating the existing memorial garden into the new Bidadari plants. It is about retaining the spirit of the place. Now, I'm mindful that Bidadari used to be a cemetery, so I meant it's maintaining the spirit in the figurative sense, but I think you understand what I mean. Now, one project that I think all of us are familiar with and close to my heart is really about our former KTM railway land. The railway corridor reminds us actually of our close ties with our friends and neighbours, Malaysia. But importantly, it joins up seven HDB towns, from Bukit Merah to Woodlands. Over a million, almost a million residents live in that area. So even before development plans are firm, I think the rail corridor already has begun to take a life of its own to connect people, to connect communities. Earlier this year, I participated in a Green Corridor run. It's a scenic 10.5 kilometer run. I was somewhere way behind, I think. And it links from, it ran from Tanjung Paga Railway Station to the old Bukit Timah Rail Station. It's a privately organized event. Over 6,000 people took part. And you know, people were just happy and joyous and you know, just took part in the run or walk. And it's about, again, like I said, connecting people, connecting communities. How do we maintain that spirit of it even as we develop? And many people have come forward with ideas. URA's plans for Rail Corridor has been enriched by many Singaporeans, by residents, students, professionals, interest groups, and people who have surfaced ideas about how this could be further developed so that we retain that element of community space. And that will be the next step as we master plan the Rail Corridor to see how do we incorporate the public feedback and how do we, importantly, in response to the desires of many people, to retain a continuous green corridor as a key, key planning parameter in the planning design and development of the rail corridor. It will be a unique space, not only just in Singapore, but in the world. Celebrating our heritage, I think, requires actually many agencies. Certainly, it involves MND, it certainly involves MCCY. Uh, there's a lot of scope for us to work with NHB and other agencies to curate and tell the stories of our places and buildings. And NHB is active in, for example, in studying how heritage elements in Bukit Brown will be commemorated. NHB has also worked with agencies and members of the community to develop many interesting heritage trails that feature national monuments and heritage sites, not just in the historical precincts in the city centre, but actually also in the heartlands. And this is where, again, as all of us MPs, we can also think about developing local trails for our people and for people to begin to see a significance to the place that they live in. So heritage has to be fully participated in. People need to be fully involved. And it must be driven by the people as well. So let me share an example. For the Singapore Memory Project, people from all walks of life have shared over 700,000 memories about Singapore. Thanks to the work of Dr. Imran Tajudin from NUS, old wooden carvings from the former Malay village will be reused in the new civic centre in Gelang Serai for the Comprehensive Marine Biodiversity Survey, which I visited and was tremendously inspired there's a lot of work done by the local and international community 
Many volunteers, academics, NGOs in the private sector have provided significant time and resource to document the fantastic array of flora and fauna found in our waters. And there are many, many more of such inspiring examples. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the many Singaporeans, the many volunteers who stepped forward to work on these issues and in these areas. And through our Singapore conversation, we will continue to welcome feedback and views on how we can and how we should be building our common sense of identity and belonging through heritage, through nature conservation. So at this juncture of our history, as we, in a sense, come of age, as we find it as an inflection point of sorts in many ways, I think we need to figure out how to balance all the different conflicting needs that we have. And we need to skillfully try to weave it together. We need to develop our infrastructure, but yet we need to preserve and we need to guide our development in a sustainable manner. And there will be times, and it, it will happen, the government will be making difficult decisions. And there will be times when the government perhaps should be stepping back so that community can step forward. And I think very often, both government and people need to step forward together to find the solutions. But the truth is, we will not always reach common consensus either. Not just between government and people, in fact, between different groups who have different interests. But what is important, and I think what's something that I've personally found is there will be common spaces, and there's lots of it. And it's how do we focus our energies to create something special together. Ultimately, what we create, what we keep, is only meaningful when there is a community appreciation, when there's ownership by our people and there's participation by our people. So let us find those spaces, and they are there, so that we can work together to build more memories, to build more gardens, and importantly, to build something that we can all be proud of in this place that we call home. Thank you very much.